I can't pay for this right now, because uh, I'm not working, so I've had to cut down on some luxuries, like uh, paying for stuff. So. <laughs> well, if you want, you can work here. I don't know. See, I was a regular on a soap opera, you know? And, and to go from that to this, it's, it's just... Hey, Ross, listen, now, you want anything to drink? Because I'm heading up there. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a coffee. Thanks, man. Sure. Coffee? Yeah. Coffee? Because I'm going up there. No, oh, no, thank you. Okay. <laughs> You guys need anything? Because I'm heading up there. I'd love uh, ice water. You got it. <laughs> Joey, what are you doing? Just being friendly. <laughs> and the mastodon is from the semi-late Jurassic period. Is it the mastodon from the Pliocene epic? Shh. This is a museum. No talking. It's just like Brad to have to have the last word. I'm sorry I'm late. What happened? We, we just want to see the end. I want you, Drake. I know you do. But you and I can never be together that way. What? There's something I never told you, Amber. I'm actually your half-brother. What? <laughs> Welcome back. Poor Joey. We pick on this guy quite a lot, don't we? Joey has trouble keeping a job down. He is a barista for like an hour and a half. He at one point was a museum tour guide with Ross and even a Christmas tree salesman for like a day. <laughs> I don't know how this guy pays rent. <laughs> Joey has a hard time keeping a job. Why? Well, he's not really good at anything, and especially the things that he's applying for. So, what's he do? Luckily, Joey finds his niche, and it ends up being acting. He gets a part on a local TV show and is cast as one of the main characters. This is a huge step up for Joey, not just because he can actually pay the bills now, but he has a role in society. I want you to imagine something with me for a second. Imagine a world where everybody's job is something they're not good at. The world obviously wouldn't run very well. Our world works because people do jobs that they're good at. Obviously, right? Did you know that the church runs in a similar way? Back in Old Testament times, there was a king named David. And David was a great ruler. And he got to a point where he was a little too old to run the kingdom, so he had to pass along all of his duties and responsibilities to his son, Solomon. But before he did that, one of his last acts as king was to organize the nation of Israel into a well-functioning society. We see King David do this in the First Chronicles. Chapter 23 tells us that David takes the priests and the Levites and all the men of Israel and gives them specific jobs that they're good at. People who are good at preaching are priests. People who are good at building are construction workers. And there's even a section for people who are good at music to be musicians. David thought of everything that the nation of Israel would need. This system is based on people doing work and it's actually the model that the church uses today. You see, at church, everyone should have a job. There are plenty of opportunities for people to shine with their specific set of skills. Some people are good at singing, so they're on the worship team. Some people are good at teaching, so they're pastors and Sunday school teachers. Some people are just dedicated workers and they simply clean the church. It doesn't matter what they do, as long as they're doing it to the glory of God. Everybody has a place. No matter where it is in the church, there's something for everybody. And that's exactly what King David knew. But the structure that David put in place didn't exactly translate over to the church as well as we thought it would. I want you to check something out with me. This graph shows that only about 20% of people who attend church volunteer at church. 
Some studies have shown that up to 80% of people who attend church just come and sit in a seat and get up and leave. Now, that can be an issue because 100% of the work that we have at church is only done by about 20% of the people who attend. Let me put it in perspective. If you have a church of around 150 people, which is roughly what our church is, that means only about 30 of those people are doing the work that the church needs. You can probably name those 30 people who are at your church. I want you to think of those people right now and thank them the next time you see them. So what's the issue I hear you ask? And that's quite a good question. Let's dig into it just a little bit. In our world, there's an attitude of consumption. What do I mean by that? Well, an attitude of consumption is simply being given when you aren't giving yourself. Guys, if we're honest, we've been trained to be given everything. Compared to the rest of the world, we honestly have so much and are given so much just for being around. I mean, our schools are free. We have an education that is provided for us. Most of us have parents that love us and care for us and provide us with meals and housing and a bed. It's not like that everywhere. Now, I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody for just simply being an American, but if we're honest, we can be spoiled sometimes. If we take a step back for just a second and we look around, we understand that we do have a lot. And with the resources and the time and the energy that we have, we should be giving back. You see, God didn't design us to be consumers. He designed us to be givers. And I'll even go as far as to say that it's sinful how we live sometimes. Now, not everyone has a problem with this, but the graph we looked at showed us that only 20% of the people are doing the work in church. So we have to ask ourselves an important question. Am I a part of the 20% or am I a part of the 80%? Now, I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody into doing things for the church, but what I am asking is that we consider what we do with our time and we consider what role we play in our church. So a good question to ask is, what can I do to help? And luckily, we have the Bible to help guide us along for what we can do. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll start in verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge, by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing, by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers and to another, prophecy, to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the works of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one, just as He determines. Now, I know that's a mouthful, okay, but what it is saying is that everybody has a special and unique gift that they can use to help bring more people in and build the kingdom of God. These are what we call spiritual gifts, and everybody has them. And the cool part is, is that it's unique to you. That's right, that means you have a spiritual gift that is handed to you from God himself. I want you to take a moment and ask yourself, what am I good at? What am I gifted at? Okay, you got it? Now, what if you don't? Some of you guys might be saying, well, I'm not really sure, and that's okay. What you can do is you can ask your neighbor. Not right now, we're watching a video, guys, come on. I'm looking at you. Ask your parents, ask your friends, ask your family members, ask your pastor. What are my gifts if you're not sure? And that's completely fine. Once you find your gift, ask this question. How can I use that gift? There are some obvious ones. If you know the Bible well, you can be a teacher. If you have a musical talent, you can be in the band. But there are some less obvious ones like what if you're good at just talking to people? You can simply talk to new people who come into church and help them feel more comfortable. Guys, there are so many gifts that people are provided with. And God has given us a huge array of abilities so that every single function that the church needs is taken care of. The only problem is that people don't usually know what to do. And that's okay. Here's another simple solution. Simply ask your pastor. Whew. Yeah, sweaty. You can see that there's some frustration there. I apologize. But remember, only about 20% of the people who attend church have anything to do with the work that needs to be done. 
So the best thing for you to do is to know what you're good at, how to use it, and apply it to what the church needs. It's as simple as that, guys. If only 15 more people started helping, we could bump that 20% up to 30%. And people will see that you're putting in work and effort into the church. And if you do that, then you might encourage other people to sign up and get involved and use their gifts that God has given them. So to sum up our lesson, be like Joey. Try out 100 jobs and eventually you'll find one that you're good at and you can help the kingdom of God grow just like how he planned it in the beginning. Guys, go find a job. Be like Joey. Use your talents for God's work. And I'll see you next week. Bye.